Today is Tuesday, October 17th, and this is William Michael of the Classical Liberal Arts Academy. Over the past couple years, I've spent a decent amount of time in my private talks discussing what's referred to as traditional Catholicism or Latin Mass Catholicism, and most of the talks that I've given have been negative because it's, it's burdened me to see what goes on uh, in these traditional Catholic circles because so much of it is sophistry, and I really dislike personally uh, the men who take leadership of many of the, the groups that identify as traditional Catholic or Latin Mass Catholics. And I feel bad for the people who get caught up following them because I see in these traditional Catholic individuals and families, especially younger people, college-age students, for example, I see something of myself when I was younger and was influenced by Protestantism and had to deal with the influence of a number of Protestant influencers, if you will, or Protestant um, teachers. And I can see many parallels between the errors that I was tangled up in under their influence, which I eventually, um, thank be to God, was, was able to um, separate myself from. But I see many of, uh, of these Catholics getting caught up in, in the errors of this uh, self-labeled traditional Catholicism, which parallels Protestantism in many ways. Now, the problem, the reason why I can empathize with uh, some of these Catholics who, who get sucked into this is because I understand the feelings that they have. I understand the thoughts that they have. I understand the desires that they have. And I can understand why this traditional Catholicism attracts them and has an appearance of being something good. Protestantism does the same thing. You have people who have, who have something of good desires, they're zealous for the Christian faith, and there's something about influential, charismatic Protestant leaders, Protestant churches, Protestant communities, Protestant activities that's attractive, and that's why people follow it. But at the, at the heart of it, really, is spiritual immaturity and pride and sin, really, in disobeying things that Christ has explicitly taught and established, which we know, which we profess as Catholics. In order to supposedly fix some problems we complain about, we're willing to do things that are clearly wrong, that should be red flags, that should be like fences that protect us, but we find more and more people willing to, to trample these fences and ignore these red flags. Now, the most glaring and obvious red flag that should immediately make Catholics think twice, is the disapproval of these movements by the Holy Father. And not just the Holy Father, but almost every bishop in the Catholic Church. Now, we'll often see these traditional Catholic groups presenting some bishop to speak on behalf of traditional Catholicism. And again, that's always to be understood in quotes because it's a, it's a misnomer. But you'll notice it's the same two or three 
bishops that are used as speakers. And these two or three bishops do not represent the body of bishops in the Catholic Church. They do not represent the bishops and they do not represent the judgment and counsel of the Holy Father. If you look into the Catechism, you'll find the Magisterium described as the Holy Father and the bishops in union with him. That's the Magisterium, and the Magisterium is a living entity. The authority of the Magisterium is living and active. It's present. It's not something we look back into the past to find. It's present with us directing us today. And this magisterium is found in the Pope and bishops, and it should be a very obvious red flag when we see people speaking against the Pope and bishops in the name of Catholicism. That's not Catholicism. No matter what anyone tries to say or how they they try to spin it, it's not Catholicism to disobey the Pope and bishops of the Church. And that should be a clear, flashing red light telling us to stop. There's a phrase that was used by Benjamin Franklin, which I like to use. Benjamin Franklin, at the time when the Constitution was being drafted in 1787, advised his fellow Americans to Doubt your own infallibility. Doubt your own infallibility. And that's, I think, a very wise warning to any Catholics who find themselves contradicting, disregarding, and even disrespecting the Pope and bishops of the Catholic Church. That should be a red flag, a flashing red light telling us to pump the brakes because we're getting into dangerous ground and we should doubt our own infallibility. Now, as I've said, I've, I've spent a lot of time over the past couple of years pointing out the errors in things that are said and written by those who claim to be traditional Catholics and who promote this Latin Mass Catholicism. There are a number of problems with it, significant problems, easily demonstrated problems. And I've, I've, I've pointed them out in past talks and articles. If you'd really like to get into the topic, I recommend you get in touch with me privately and we can discuss these things in detail and write back and forth but I've talked about them publicly quite a bit. I've pointed out the flaws, I've showed errors in the arguments, I've shown errors in the facts that are presented on which the arguments are based, and so on. What I'd like to do today is is something different. I'd like to explain positively, positively, what Catholics should do, what Catholics should positively do if they feel themselves unsatisfied by, let's say, modern parish life or mainstream Catholicism or modern Catholic culture. What should Catholics do positively? Now you may wonder, why would I, a man who speaks against traditional Catholics, and again, that's quote-unquote traditional Catholics, and the reason I say quote-unquote or so-called traditional Catholics is there's no such thing as traditional Catholicism that contradicts popes and bishops. Nowhere. Never. So the use of the phrase traditional Catholicism is sort of an oxymoron when you're disagreeing with the Pope and bishops. 
Why would a person who speaks against this so-called traditional Catholicism think that he had some valuable advice to offer to those who find themselves tied up in these activities? And the reason, or the answer I should say, is because we have a lot in common. We have a lot in common. As you know, or may know, may, maybe, maybe you don't know, maybe I shouldn't assume this, but I've worked for 25 years as a Catholic classicist to research and restore classical Catholic education. I don't like modern Catholic education. I'm not interested in modern Catholic education. I don't like modern Catholic educational culture. I don't like modern Catholic colleges. When I look back into history, I see Catholic doctors of the church. I see Catholic educators, Catholic schools doing things that are completely different from what modern Catholic schools are doing based on completely different principles, completely different philosophies, completely different systems of education. I've spent, as I said, 25 years now researching and working to restore classical Catholic education in the Classical Liberal Arts Academy. That's what I do. That's my life's work. It's my vocation, my apostolate as a lay Dominican. It's what I do all day, every day. So I know the frustration that the so-called traditional Catholics feel. I understand the desire for more and how frustrating it can be at times to have that desire inside of you and feel like You haven't chosen that desire, but that desire has chosen you. And you feel like you owe it to the Lord to do something about it. This is where my criticism of traditional Catholics really begins. I think that what they choose to do about it is wrong. Just like the Protestants who had some legitimate arguments against the Catholic Church at the time, but they chose to proceed with those objections in ways that were spiritually destructive and wrong. And I believe that this is what so-called traditional Catholics are doing today. It parallels the Protestant schism in many ways. And in my work in education, I think that I have succeeded in avoiding this error. My knowledge of Protestantism has helped me to avoid this error, and it's one of the reasons I think my work in education has been not only successful, but it's also been supported and encouraged by the clergy. I've never had any trouble I've never had anything but support and encouragement from the clergy, even though what I'm doing could be interpreted as a kind of complaining or criticism or protest against what the modern church is doing in education. There's a, there's a, a significant difference, though, in what I've done and in what the traditional Catholics do, or what the Protestants do. And I'd like to share this with those who who feel that sense of frustration or that burden and need to seek something extraordinary, to seek something that goes beyond what's being offered in, let's say, the local parish or in the church you know, in the mainstream Catholic Church today. I'd like to talk about this a little bit because I think I can offer something helpful, positively helpful. 
and I think you'll I think you'll appreciate what I have to say. Now, as I said, I've worked to research and restore a form of education that once was considered normal in the Catholic Church, but today is extraordinary. It's, it's almost non-existent. And we look at modern Catholic schools, we look at modern Catholic homeschool families, modern Catholic colleges and universities, and we see lots of stuff that had no place in Catholic education before, let's say, the late 1800s. There was a massive shift in education that, that's similar to the shift that took place in liturgical life in the church, which the traditional Catholics are more concerned with. Now, what I've done that's been successful, what I think the key is, is I've recognized that I'm being called to something extraordinary, something better, something more rigorous, something greater. It's my calling. But what I understand <clears throat> is that when God gives someone an extraordinary calling, he gives it to an individual, and it's the individual's responsibility to take that calling upon himself and seek to fulfill it privately, not publicly, but privately and individually. When I felt moved to restore classical Catholic education, I took that work upon myself privately. I went to the bishop in 2007 and asked for permission to do it. I made it very clear that, this, that I was qualified to do it. I was a professional classicist with 10 years of, of classroom teaching and school administrative experience. I told him that I wanted to work to restore classical Catholic education, and I intended to do it privately. Um, I needed nothing from the church. I, I simply wanted to have a clear conscience and know that the bishop was aware of what I intended to do, and uh, I wanted permission before I got started because I, I wanted to do this work in an orderly way which is how Catholic works should be done. If you go back and look at the saints, you'll find that they always worked in an orderly way. And so I was, I was encouraged to go forward with it. I was not only encouraged to go forward with my plans, but I was encouraged to do even more. I was even encouraged to consider starting an independent Catholic school within the diocese which you know, I, I wasn't even thinking about. But the response of the diocese went above and beyond what I expected. And I started the Classical Liberal Arts Academy and have had great success. But I believe that the reason why it was met with approval and support was because I explained it to be my calling and I explained that I was going to pursue this calling independently. That I wasn't asking for help. I didn't need the bishop to do me any favors. I didn't need any Catholic schools to do anything. I didn't need money. I was going to pursue this myself. This was a cross that I was going to bear myself. And I received nothing but support and encouragement because that's what an extraordinary calling looks like. Now, when we turn to this traditional Catholic community, we often find something very different. We often find Catholics complaining that the church doesn't do things for them. And this is another red flag that something's wrong. What we usually find is Catholics complaining that the local parish doesn't offer a Latin Mass, or the local parish is not reverent enough, or the local parish 
doesn't do this the right way or doesn't offer this or the local priests don't do this or don't do that. The bishop doesn't approve this and doesn't do this and doesn't offer that. We find individual Catholics claiming to have some extraordinary calling who demand that other people take up the cross of their supposed calling. And this is a clear sign that they are not pursuing a calling in the right way and that they may not in fact have such a calling. It may be a bunch of baloney. They're asking for benefits that are extraordinary, but they're asking for someone else to provide those benefits. And that's not how an extraordinary calling works. And I'd like to give a number of examples from church history that I think you'll appreciate. <clears throat> First of all, when our Lord walked through Israel during his life on earth, he called men to follow him. And if you read the Gospels carefully, you'll see that he was giving two different callings to the men and women that he spoke to. One was a general calling for men and women to follow him, to be baptized and to become Christians. That was the general, that was the mainstream calling, the mainstream message he preached. He called men and women to follow him into the sacramental life in the church that he was establishing. And when he spoke to the people, he spoke to them very gently, very mercifully, very patiently. He knew that they were weak. He knew they needed help. He knew they had all kinds of problems, that they would face all kinds of trouble. And he was very gentle with them. And yet, at other times, we find him almost preaching a different religion to, to other people. We see, for example, when the rich young ruler came to Jesus and asked him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus told that young man, go sell everything you have, give it all to the poor, and then come follow me. And for some reason, that man was given a different command than other people. He was given an extraordinary calling. He was invited to become one of Christ's disciples who actually lived and ministered with him. We find that he did this to other men as well. He did this to Peter and James and John and, and the other of the twelve disciples. The calling that he placed upon them was extraordinary. It was different from the calling that he made to people in general. A few men were given extraordinary callings. They were called to live with him, to follow him, to seek the way of perfection. It's an important phrase, the way of perfection. And they eventually became the apostles and bishops of the church. So we see that there's a variety of callings. There's an ordinary calling to conversion, to baptism, to the sacramental life, to membership in the church, and so on. And we see this sort of thing when we look at the, the precepts of the church. We see that they're, they're quite simple. They're quite, quite gentle. That's the general calling of the church. And yet we know that there's much, much more. There's calling to the way of perfection, which we find practiced by the saints, spoken of by saints and doctors of the church. When we learn about early church history, we read about hermits who lived in the desert. That's obviously not a normal response to the ordinary calling to the Christian life. It's an extraordinary calling. 
And we know that in the early church, those desert hermits were considered by many to be the spiritual masters of the church. We see this in the writings of John Cassian, who actually traveled out into the deserts and interviewed the hermits and asked them for spiritual direction. Now, when we see how those extraordinary callings were responded to by men, we see that those men individually understood that they had an extraordinary calling. And they knew that they had to respond to it in an extraordinary way. And they did so. And yet we don't find them yelling at Christians in general to do what they're doing. They took it upon themselves. They understood it was an extraordinary call. And they carried that cross themselves. That's the different response. That's the right approach to this. I'd like to share another example. Later in church history, we find St. Benedict. And we find him in the 500s, I think, writing a rule for monastic life. And many today who who hear about the rule of St. Benedict or talk about the rule of St. Benedict, imagine that the rule of St. Benedict is some sort of strict ascetic rule for monastic life. But when we actually read the rule, we find that it's no such thing. First of all, there were already rules in existence when St. Benedict wrote his rule. There were already strict rules of life for those who wanted to seek the way of perfection. St. Benedict's rule was not such a rule. I'd like to read from the last chapter in St. Benedict's rule. Listen to what St. Benedict has to say. He says, We have written this rule in order that by its observance in monasteries we may show that we have attained some degree of virtue and the rudiments or basics of the religious life. We have written this rule, he says, in order that by its observance in monasteries we may show that we have attained some degree of virtue and the rudiments of the religious life. In other words, St. Benedict was saying, this rule is not a rule to be followed by those who want to seek the way of perfection. This is a gentler, more general way to be employed by monasteries for those who desire to show that they have attained some degree of virtue and the rudiments or the basics of the religious life. And he goes on to say this, But for those who would hasten to the perfection of that life, for those who would hasten to the perfection of that life, for those with an extraordinary calling, these are my words, He says, there are the teaching of the Holy Fathers, the observance of which leads to the height of perfection. He goes on to say, for what page or what utterance of the divinely inspired books of the Old and New Testaments is not a most unerring rule for Christian life? Or, What book of the Holy Catholic Fathers does not loudly proclaim that we may come by a straight course to our Creator? Then the conferences and the institutes, there he's referring to the writings of John Cassian, the conferences and the institutes and the lives of the Fathers, as also the rule of our Holy Father 
Basil. What else are they but tools of virtue for right living and obedient monks? But for us who are lazy and ill living and negligent, they are a source of shame and confusion. Whoever you are, therefore, who are hastening to the heavenly homeland, fulfill with the help of Christ this minimum rule, which we have written for beginners, and then, at length, under God's protection, you will attain to the loftier heights of doctrine and virtue which we have mentioned above. Now notice how St. Benedict thinks about the spiritual life, because this is where I would argue traditional Catholics go astray and do not imitate the saints or follow the wisdom of the doctors of the Church. Notice how St. Benedict understands that there are different levels of sanctity. There are different callings. Some, he says, are lazy, ill-living, and negligent. And yet, at the same time, they're lazy and ill-living and negligent Christians. They're not unbelievers. They're not careless sinners. But they're weak Christians. They're beginners, and they acknowledge that, and they need a rule that presents them with the minimum, as he says. And that's the general rule. That's the general rule. And what St. Benedict says is, if you are not content with the general rule, it's not proper for you to complain that the monasteries should be more strict. It's not for you to complain that the rule is not as strict as it can be and put that pressure on the general community or the, monaster, the mainstream monastery, as it were. That's not what the rule of St. Benedict is for. That's not what the mainstream monastery is for. If you want something more, you should pursue that on your own. If you have an extraordinary calling, you should also have extraordinary grace. You should also have extraordinary strength that will enable you to pursue these things in a more private way carrying that cross yourself, seeking that more perfect way yourself or with a smaller, different community that you need to go and seek out. And I want you to see how Benedict describes what we find in the mainstream Catholic Church. We find a church that's designed for the lazy, ill-living, and negligent Catholics. And while we say that, you understand that it's really not a criticism. It's simply saying the mainstream church is for Christians who are beginners, who are weak, who need help, who need to know what the minimums are, who need to be able to grow slowly and steadily over time, maybe over a long time, and that that's normal. That's not a sign that something is wrong in the church. That's not a sign that the church is unfaithful. We see that even in the rule of St. Benedict, that principle of establishing a general rule that is reasonable for a larger group of of Christians. And the individual Christians, the extraordinary Christians who want more, are encouraged to go for it and seek it on their own. 
That's how the way of perfection works. That's why hermits lived by themselves in the deserts. So when we find Catholics claiming to have some extraordinary calling or being called to some extraordinary virtue or some extraordinary culture, and they're complaining at the general or mainstream church that it's not providing that for them, we find that those Catholics are not acting properly in light of what they claim to be called to. And this is where they err. And so we find Catholics constantly complaining, complaining about the Pope, complaining about the bishops, complaining about priests, complaining about the parishes, complaining about the, the liturgy, complaining about the music, complaining about the architecture of the church, complaining, 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 as if someone else is supposed to provide them with the extraordinary Catholicism that they're looking for, that they claimed to, that they claim to be called to. And that's not how an extraordinary calling works. And again, I offer myself as, as another example with classical Catholic education. I didn't complain about Catholic schools. I don't complain today about Catholic schools. I understand that Catholic schools are designed to serve the general student body. They're not intended to provide students with an extraordinary classical Catholic education. I understand that. I, I don't criticize the, the Catholic schools. I understand they serve a different purpose, a more general, a broader purpose, and they do so effectively. I didn't ask the bishop to create a school for my idea of education. I didn't ask a school to hire me and allow me to do what I want to do and pursue my own standards. When I realized that I had a calling to do something extraordinary in education, I understood that it was an independent project for me to carry myself. And that's how I pursued it. And it's not only successful, but it's very, very satisfying. Because I don't have to compromise. I don't have to find a large number of people who share my views, who will do everything the way that I want to do it. I can, I can search for students and families through the population of the entire world for students who are willing to pursue the studies that were studied throughout church history, again, by a very small number of Catholics in history. But I don't have the pressure that a modern local school has to serve a local population that it really doesn't get to choose. But I had to create the Classical Liberal Arts Academy on my own to serve my own goals in Catholic education. This is what Jesus called disciples to do when he was alive, and this is what St. Benedict explains should be done by those who want more. They should take that burden upon themselves. And yet, as I said, when we look at this traditional Catholic community, we find a bunch of people who spend most of their time complaining about what other people are not doing for them. And that's the essential sign, I could say, that, that spiritually it's not right. It's not a Catholic movement. It's not a Catholic approach. It's not a Catholic spirit. It's not the spirit of saints and doctors of the church who did great things. It's not the spirit of the desert fathers who sought perfection. It's just an idle, complaining spirit. And I believe, really, it's, it's, it's a sign that, that these people are full of baloney, because that's not how people with extraordinary calling act. So what should they do? What should Catholics do who want more? What should they do? Now, one of the, the things that I often 
question about people who complain about these things is, I often question why it seems that when they refer to traditional Catholicism, they seem to focus almost exclusively on the Mass, when the Mass, when the mass is just a part of traditional Catholicism. We often, very often, find people talking up the Latin Mass. Oh, the Latin Mass, the Latin Mass, the Latin Mass. Well, the, the Mass is just a part of traditional Catholic culture. I don't find these people talking about returning to classical Catholic education, which, again, is only available today in the Classical Liberal Arts Academy. I don't find a concern for a return to traditional Catholic education. Many of them start these fake classical schools, which are an embarrassment to Catholic tradition, have nothing at all to do with scholastic philosophy or any kind of traditional Catholic education. And they know that. It's blatantly obvious. They don't even pretend to be offering historical Catholic education. They're concerned about the Latin Mass, but not about traditional Catholic education, which I find strange. And they're often also not concerned with traditional Catholic personal or private devotion. We don't find great zeal for the Latin Divine Office, which is an entire system of daily prayers that would occupy their whole day and take every spare minute they have. There would be no time for a Taylor Marshall video or a Father Altman conference or some other wacky Latin Mass nonsense if they were praying the Divine Office every day. There'd be no time. We don't find them becoming great students of sacred scripture like the saints were throughout church history. We don't find them learning Latin so they can study the Vulgate and so they can study the writings of the church uh, doctors in Latin. We don't find them systematically studying the Summa Theologica. For some reason, all of this complaining, all of this talk about traditional Catholicism is restricted to the Latin Mass. And again, this is another flashing red sign for me that this isn't serious. It's really not an interest in pursuing some extraordinary spiritual life or some extraordinary devotional life or culture. It's really very Protestant, just like Protestants who spend their time church hopping, if you know anything about Protestant culture, They spend most of their life church hopping, constantly evaluating churches and bouncing from one church to another, asking what that church has to offer them. Looking at churches almost as as, as theater shows that Christians evaluate and judge and review, and they, they are constantly searching for the best show in town. When I see Catholics complaining about the masses that are offered or the quality of the, the culture at different parishes and, and these sorts of things, I find P- Catholics who are just acting like Protestants, church hopping, looking for the best show, as I said. And this, we don't find anything like this in any lives of saints or doctors of the church. We don't find any of this culture. This is, this is not Catholic culture. This is not Catholic behavior. This is Protestantish, schismatic, fussy, effeminate culture. We don't see a, a, a holistic commitment of any kind to traditional Catholic culture or devotion. We just find this lazy, shallow whining about the Latin Mass, which again is only a piece of traditional Catholic culture, only a piece. 
So I would say to someone who claims to be called by God to some extraordinary Catholic culture that exceeds that which is available in the mainstream Catholic parish, I would, I would ask, well, are you, are you working to pray the divine office throughout the day every day in Latin? Are you working to pray the divine office? Are you taking that extraordinary burden upon yourself? and showing yourself to have a real concern for traditional Catholic culture? Are you taking up the study of the classical liberal arts and scholastic philosophy? Are you taking upon yourself the study of the sacred scriptures? These are things that belong to traditional Catholic culture. If not, what are you talking about? If all you have to talk about is the Latin Mass, like it's some sort of, you know, magic show, where do you find any such talk in the history of the church? Where do you find any saint, for example, talking about how crucial the Latin Mass is to the pursuit of sanctity? We never find anything like that. We find saints talking about sacred scripture. We find saints talking about Catholic studies. We find saints engaged in apostolates like education all through history. We find saints developing all aspects of Catholic culture all through history. We don't find saints complaining about the pope or bishops or priests or parishes of the church. Show me an example. We don't find saints acting the way the so-called traditional Catholics act. It's very simple to observe and recognize. Now the solution, like I said, And notice that I'm not criticizing those who claim to have an extraordinary calling, who claim to want more. I'm not saying that that's wrong. What I'm saying is what you do with that calling can be wrong. The way that you interpret and respond to that sense that you should pursue something greater something more perfect, how you respond to that calling can be wrong. And what I see, the so-called traditional Catholic movement and all of this Latin mass talk, what I see those people doing is wrong. The problem with the response and what they do is that it suggests that their calling may not be true at all because they don't act like people with an extraordinary calling. They're complaining. They're constantly showing signs of weakness rather than, rather than greater strength. They don't show the signs of people with extraordinary callings. They don't show signs that they have the virtues that we find in saints, where saints do have extraordinary callings and we see them filled with extraordinary graces to to carry out those extraordinary callings. These people complaining about bishops and popes and masses and, and parishes, these people are not doing what saints do. They're doing what Protestants do. And that's, again, a red flag for me. <clears throat> now, I can, I can empathize, again, because I have an extraordinary calling in this sense of, of or in the, in the area of education. But I think the way that I've responded to it is the right way. And my message to so-called traditional Catholics or Catholics who have a desire for traditional Catholicism is to pursue that calling, pursue those desires, 
but understand that it's your responsibility to do so privately. If there's any, any false motive in this, if you're doing it to make friends, if you're doing it for some social life or social activity or because you want to feel like a part of a group or you like exalting yourself over others, if there's any, if there's any motivation to pursue that that's not virtuous, you're going to find that you don't have the motivation to pursue it privately. You don't have the motivation to pursue it for God's sake, who you claim is the one calling you. Like when Jesus says, when you pray, go in your room and close the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you openly. You don't have that kind of faith to do it privately secretly, for God's sake. If everything that you seek is public, if everything that you seek requires an audience and a crowd of people to be around you and with you, if everything has to be done publicly, your religion sounds more like the religion that Jesus talks about among the scribes and Pharisees who like to pray on the corners of the streets, who like to blow trumpets before they do their works, who like to be seen by men. That's not true Christianity. If you're called to greater things and you claim that it's God who is calling you to them, then you should be perfectly comfortable pursuing those things in the presence of God, in private. The first step the first step would not be to focus on Latin Mass. The first step would not be to focus on Latin Mass. If you're called to some traditional Catholic devotional life and culture, the first step would not be to seek out the Latin Mass. And the reason why is because that's not in your control. You don't have control over what masses are offered where and so on, and that can't be your first priority. If you claim to be interested in traditional Catholic culture and devotion, your first commitment should be to praying the divine office because that is entirely in your control. You can focus on it all day, every day. You can recite the Latin Divine Office all day, every day. That's in your control. You don't need a priest to do that for you. You don't need a bishop to approve that for you or to organize that for you. You don't need 10 people to join you to do that. You can do that by yourself, for God's sake, in fulfillment of this extraordinary calling that you claim to have to traditional Catholic devotion and culture. You can pray the Latin Divine Office daily. And guess what? I do. I do. I don't talk about it much. I do it privately. I'm a classicist, though. I'm fluent in Latin. I read the Latin Vulgate for my daily Bible reading. I recite the Divine Office. I don't talk much about the Latin Mass because it's not offered where I live, and it's not in my control. I don't, I don't bother myself with it. At our Dominican chapter meetings, we're, we're fortunate to have the opportunity to celebrate the Latin Mass, and I do so, and I enjoy it, but that's, that's all I talk about it, because the Mass and Masses that are offered are not in my control, and I'm not going to turn my family's life upside down and live a crazy life so I can attend a Latin Mass, because there's much more for me to pursue in the name of traditional Catholic devotion and culture. And the Latin Mass is just a part of it. And in God's providence, I do get to enjoy the celebration of the Latin Mass. But normally on uh, weekdays or on Sundays, I simply go to the local parish, focus on the essential elements of the Eucharist, focus on the sacraments, 
Don't pay attention to external things or accidental things which really don't matter, which are distractions for men who are not wise, who don't pay attention to essential things. And I enjoy the sacramental life provided by my bishop through our local parish priest. And I don't ask the local parish to satisfy my desire for a more extraordinary devotional life or culture or education or worship. That's my burden, and I seek that privately. I don't ask the, the, the bishop to, to start a Latin parish where I live. I don't ask the local priest to start offering Latin masses. I don't need that. There's plenty for me to do as a Catholic to satisfy my desire for a more excellent culture and devotional life. Things that are in my control that I can do privately that don't depend on there being any other people around who share my desires or share my standards or share my thoughts. I can do it privately and it's all approved by the church and as long as I do it privately, mind my own business, it's approved and blessed in the church. Even though I'm a Dominican, I, I recite the Benedictine Divine Office, which you'll find recited every day at, at Clear Creek Abbey here in America. I recite that same office they do throughout the day. Of course, as a lay person, I don't get to do it every day. I don't get to do every hour of every day, but as a Dominican, I've promised to pray morning and evening prayer daily as far as I'm able, and I always make that my priority, but then when time allows, I'll add other offices as well. You'll see me occasionally posting things on the Academy website out of the Divine Office because I'm, I, that's what I'm doing privately on my own. But I'm also working to support the, the general celebration and use of the modern Liturgy of the Hours for a, a broader audience. I don't, expect, I don't expect Catholics to do what I do. I don't expect most Catholics to do what a full-time classicist does in terms of Catholic culture and devotion. I don't, ex I don't expect that. That would be foolish to expect that. I pursue it myself. And I enjoy it myself, and I enjoy it without really any interference or disturbance, which makes it very satisfying. Like I said, I'm fluent in Latin. I read the Latin Vulgate every day. I study the Summa Theologica in the original language. I can do that because I'm devoted to classical Catholic education, but also to a more extraordinary traditional Catholic devotion. I believe that if traditional Catholics would, would consider these things, they, they would find that there's no reason to be frustrated in the modern church. There's no reason to be all wrapped up in what other people are doing, to worry about what, what other Catholics are doing or what you know, the local parish is doing, because it, it really has nothing to do with private devotional life. And they can live a very satisfying life life for God's sake, coram Deo, if you know what that phrase means. They can live a very satisfying Catholic life with peace, with their devotional life in their control, with no one capable of, of disturbing them or interfering with them or, or failing to provide them with something that they need. It's, it's all in their control. And you can enjoy that life with perfect peace. If you're able to attend an approved Latin Mass locally, that's a great blessing. If you can't attend a local approved Mass, then it's no big deal. You can save Latin Masses for special occasions, maybe holidays or certain times where you take a retreat or something like that. But to see people actually going to, to disapproved masses is just Protestantism. It's just craziness. You've run off the rails. And 
You've allowed yourself to be deceived to a point where imagining yourself to be more Catholic, you've become un-Catholic by disobeying the hierarchy of the church, which has never, ever been a part of Catholic tradition or culture. That's what I'd like to try to help people avoid. And like I said, you have this desire, this yearning for more, more excellent devotion, more rigorous devotion, more satisfying devotion. I would argue that it starts with the study of sacred scripture and the divine office, or even even the rosary. You could simply devote yourself more fervently to the rosary, praying the entire rosary every day rather than just one decade. There's so much that you could do that getting to the point where you're complaining about Latin masses really just is seen to be so ridiculous because there's already so much available for you to do within traditional Catholicism. Sitting around whining about Latin masses is really an excuse, I think, to avoid the right response to what may be an extraordinary calling. I can empathize with the desire. I can empathize with admiration for historic Catholic devotional resources and liturgies and culture. I can empathize with that. And if we look at the the rule of St. Benedict, we see that Catholics did the same thing then. While St. Benedict was concerned with more of a general mainstream monastic life, there were Catholics among those Catholics who wanted more, who wanted greater things, and St. Benedict told them where to go get it. But it wasn't to be sought at the monastery on Main Street. It wasn't to be sought in the general Benedictine community. It was to be sought privately through the known sources. And that's what I see the so-called traditional Catholics not doing, which to me raises suspicion about their sincerity. Because what they do is not consistent with what saints do. Because this, this desire for more, this desire for better, this desire for what's perfect, has been a part of Christianity from the beginning. But the way that they respond to it is not how Christians have responded to it from the beginning. And there's nothing traditional about it at all. If you make it your own private pursuit and focus on those parts of the Christian life that are in your control... I believe you can satisfy the desire that you claim to have for an extraordinary devotion and culture and worship while avoiding the errors of misguided and immature and weak Christians who have persuaded themselves that complaining about other men's activities is a sign of real devotion. And what's even worse is you've got these these con men on social media exploiting this immaturity, exploiting this misguided zeal, and trying to, to stir up, think of how evil it is, trying to stir up in Catholics a distrust and even hatred for the Holy Father and bishops of the church. What could be more evil? What could be more anti-Catholic? And yet this is what happens when, when we, we, we get into an idea that's bad. You know the saying, ideas have consequences. You have a sense that you should offer God something extraordinary, but you're deceived into interpreting that desire wrongly, misapplying that calling, misinterpreting that calling, and then pursuing it in a disorderly and ungodly way with these 
clowns on social media stirring you up in your error and urging you on in your foolishness. Like I said, if you were praying the divine office, if you were studying the scriptures with your spare time, if you were studying the Summa Theologica and other traditional devotional resources, the kind of things that St. Benedict recommends, like the conferences and institutes of John Cassian, the lives of the church fathers. In my case, I, I chose to pursue a lay Dominican vocation which challenges me and keeps me busy. I don't have time to watch some goofy video by, by some YouTube spiritual director that's you know, appointed himself a guru. I don't have time to follow a canceled priest. How, how, how stupid and vain can one get? I don't have time to pay attention to some isolated bishop who doesn't represent the mind of the Pope and bishops of the church. I don't have time to read books written by modern authors about church controversies, giving counsel within, in books that aren't even approved by the church to be printed. I have no time for that. I'm studying my divine office and the scriptures and the catechism. I'm studying the Summa Theologica. I'm studying the classical liberal arts. I'm studying the things saints actually studied. There's no time for this other stuff. And if you get yourself into the good stuff, you'll see. There's no time for that nonsense. And if you, if you make a priority of the nonsense, you get what you deserve. The confusion, the frustration, the disobedience, the schism, and so on, are the fruits of your error. And they're very evident in the lives of many Catholics today. So I hope that that's helpful. I hope that's some positive advice. And like I said, I can empathize, and I've practiced this myself, and know what you're feeling when you're, when you're having good thoughts I also, unfortunately, know what you're thinking when you're having bad thoughts. But my advice to you is to seek to fulfill this calling to an extraordinary Catholic life privately, focusing first on those things that are in your control and not making something that's not in your control to become the main thing. I hope that that's helpful. God bless.